Today we're going to talk about Cortex. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about what happened since the beginning of this year, and then what do we have in plan for Cortex. Uh, so here's the agenda. Oh, to, oh, actually, let me introduce myself first. So my name is Alvin. I'm one of the uh, software development manager at AWS. I joined as a Cortex maintainer about a year ago. Uh, I started to look into the query path a lot, so I have a, a little bit of technical knowledge there. But nowadays, I mainly do releases, uh, doing some chore work, like upgrading Go Runtime to 1.19.2 and all that, all security patching and all that. And here with me is Alan, who is the actual brain of Cortex, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Alan. I also work with, uh, for AWS on all these teams. Uh, been work with, working with Cortex for the last two years. Uh, working in scalability, availability, uh, became maintainer in the last year. Uh, yeah, trying to make Cortex a better place. Cool, thanks, Alan. So Alan does most of the work. I essentially do nothing and just tell Alan to do work. Um, and here with me is the uh, Fedric. Of course, he's not here with me physically, but uh, he's very unfortunate he couldn't make it. So Fedric is actually a very long time Cortex user. He deployed Cortex uh, clusters for Adobe, and he runs, uh, I think the number he told me is uh, hundreds of clusters. Uh, and if you were ever in, ever, ever in the uh, CNCF Cortex channel, then you ask question, then Cortex is the person who will answer your question. So he is really active in the, in the uh, channel answering any questions regarding configuration, uh, optimization, and all that. Last but not, but not the least, uh, we also have a, a maintainer for, uh, from, from Germany, and then his name is Niklas. Uh, I didn't want to go into LinkedIn and search him out if he's like stalking, so I just grabbed his uh, GitHub profile picture, and that's what his GitHub profile picture looks like. And he's the maintainer for the Helm chart, and he's very active. If you uh, feel, feel that, hey, Helm chart is missing some configuration, add it, add it, and then uh, Niklas will always be there to, uh, to uh, merge the PR. Cool, so today's agenda. Uh, so I would imagine not a lot of people know what Cortex, Cortex is and how, how does it work, so we will do a quick introduction to, um, to talk about Cortex, and then we'll do a little bit of the architectural dive deep for Cortex. Then now I wanna introduce the three exciting features that's coming to Cortex uh, in the next release, which will be 1.14. And I'll, I'll give one operational tip. So if you're running Cortex right now, then you should do this when you get back to, uh, get back to work. It's really useful. Like uh, we run a lot of Cortex cluster back in AWS and that's one of the tips that uh, saves us, us a lot of memories. Then we'll do some look back to see what happened for the Cortex release 1.13. Then we will go through the voice of community or we call it the roadmap. Then we will talk about the uh, call to actions. We need help, Cortex need help and then uh, I, I would love uh, more contribution to Cortex. Then we'll do our favorite part, which is the Q&A. All right, so what is Cortex? Cortex is a horizontally scalable, highly available, multi-tenant, long-term storage for Prometheus. So what does that mean? Uh, when we think about Prometheus, initially when it was designed, it's designed to be installed on a single machine, uh, scrap a, a, a cluster of metrics, and then it's stored it on your local, local drive. Uh, the problem is your local drive cannot be as big as, as you would like to, so you usually have like a very fairly short-term uh, retention period. So Cortex is trying to solve that problem. But in order to be able to store a lot of, uh, a lot of metrics, uh, millions, billions of metrics, you need scale. So essentially what Cortex is doing is to take a bit, bits and pieces of uh, Cortex and then make it into microservices. So you have a, you have a microservice querying, a microservice for ingestion, a microservice for the moving data to the long-term storage, a microservice for reading data from the long-term storage. So like a, saying Cortex is a long-term storage is a little bit misleading because it's not just storage, it is actually a system that allow querying. Uh, and Cortex is a CNCF project, it's, it's uh, incubating an Apache 2.0 license, so you can do anything with it. A uh, bunch of contributors, about 250 of them, lots of watches, uh, 5K star, and so far we have about 5,000 commits. And then Alan here is making the commits going up every single day. So um, it is actually a very active project. This is a very uh, high level view, a bird's eye view, at a very high level of Cortex. So essentially what it is, a typical use case of Cortex, you have a bunch of Prometheus, right? So you have one Prometheus for cluster A, one Prometheus for cluster B, so on and so forth. What you can do is you can configure Prometheus to do a remote write into Cortex. All of them can just do a remote write to Cortex. You, if you wanna differentiate between clusters, you can do add a label during remote write to differentiate different clusters. 
they just saying to saying saying to Cortex, then you attach your dashboard tooling like a Grafana or whatever dashboard that, that's uh, you feel liking, then you get a global view of your matrix. Right, you don't have to uh, go to like Prometheus A to look at cluster A, Prometheus B to look at uh, cluster B's matrix. So because remote write, it is the protocol that it's uh, fairly stable uh, from Prometheus. So it's, you don't have to just use Prometheus. You can also use the tools like uh, OpenTelemetry to send metrics to uh, Cortex. Or if you're a little bit more adventurous and then you like writing code, you can actually write your own code in Golang, Java, in C, C++, whatever you want, and just make sure the message is in the uh, remote write format, then you should be able to send it to Cortex. And you can send a lot of uh, metrics to Cortex. You will be able to handle it. So next, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into that Cortex icon to see how it actually works under the hood. Oh God, this looks complicated, Alan. I think I need your help for this one. Well, I will try my best here. Yeah, uh, we, as you can see, like uh, the community is saying that Cortex can scale a lot. Uh, it can send a bunch of metrics, it's high available, but it's complex to set up. So uh, this is what used to be Cortex in the past uh, year or so. We are trying to, we are deprecating some dead code and some uh, deprecated storage. So we're moving even from the code base and don't worry, does, this is not what Cortex looks like uh, anymore. It looks more like this. Uh, this is a typical Cortex deployment uh, that you can find. Uh, you can see like in the yellow there, uh, that's the right path. Uh, so remote, remote right comes from Prometheus. Uh, and in, the, in green there, uh, that's the read path. So we still have some components. They, I will try to explain what, what is uh, what are each one of those components and hopefully it will make more sense uh, at the end of the list. Uh, I will start with the right path. So uh, what, what happens when uh, Prometheus send a write uh, request to Cortex, right? Uh, the first component that uh, read, like that's reach that is the, it's called distributor. And what is the distributor? Distributor is basically uh, a gateway but uh, that will forward the request to the, the right ingesters. Ingesters are uh, the storage nodes. Distributor will just forward the request for them. But why we need the distributor? So distributor will, uh, it, it will do sharding and replicate your data. And, uh, and do like pertinent sharding and replicate your data. And uh, we, optionally we have, you can set up things like shuffle sharding that will improve your tenant isolation uh, or zone aware, awareness replication. So distributor is, is the guy that will make sure that is sending one copy of your data for, to uh, each AZ. It also does things like rate limiting and AJ data up. So you, if you have a Prometheus server that uh, is sending, is uh, deployed in a, uh, AJ mode, uh, distributor is the guy that will receive the same one sample and uh, throw on the floor the second one. After the distributor, uh, we have the ingesters, and the ingesters are basically uh, multi-tenant TSDB. So remember, Alvin said that uh, what Cortex does is, is take Prometheus and put in different microservices. Prometheus is basically a TSDB and a query engine. Uh, the ingesters is the house of the TSDB. So. The first time that I receive a sample to one tenant, uh, ingesters receive a sample, sample for one tenant, it will create the TSDB block, uh, the TSDB instance, we'll keep appending that, and the after is configurable, but after, uh, it typically after two hours, you'll send those TSDB blocks to the block storage. And the block storage can be uh, on Google Cloud Storage, S3, uh, any block storage that you want. We have support for Azure as well. But now we can see that uh, as I was sending data, so the data was that were on disk was replicated. I sent to one replica for each to HAZ, and now I have all this data, uh, duplicated data on S3. So that is where the compactor comes in. The compactor will uh, get all those blocks, it will compact and compress those blocks and you make sure that this data is in the, is in the uh, optimal way to be queried. Uh, it also does things like uh, housekeeping. So uh, if, you are, if you configure your retention period for one year, the compactor is uh, the guy that will start to delete blocks that's older than one year and things like that. Uh, 
Again, all those components can be shuffle sharded and deployed in, in, uh, with zone awareness, so you, you have uh, easy, tolerant, and uh, tenant isolation. This is basically the write path. But then you have to query your data, right? So uh, in the read path, uh, the first component is, is called query front end, which you do the similar thing that distributor does, but for the query, uh, it will shuffle shard uh, and, and uh, make sure that queries for a given tenant are spread across this. Uh, but it does more than that, right? Like it does uh, uh, QoS, for instance. So it makes sure that uh, one tenant is not starving other tenants. Or, uh, or do like cache of caches. Uh, so imagine that you have your dashboard there that's like refreshing every minute. And instead of like recomputing or ex re executing the whole query, the cache front end will just like uh, fetch the delta from the last refresh to the refresh right now. Uh, and do like things like vertical, vertical and horizon horizontal sharding. Uh, query sharding that I think Alvin will talk a little bit more about that, but it's basically uh, get, uh, trying to split one query in multiple uh, smaller queries so I can run them in parallel uh, in multiple qu querier spawn. After the query front end, we have the querier. The querier is uh, the house for the PromQL engine now. So we, have, we run the Prometheus PromQL engine uh, in that component and basically receives the uh, query request, fetch data from ingesters for recent data or for histo from storage gateways for historical data, uh, merge all of them, uh, e evaluate the query, uh, return the result back to the query front end and to the customer. Uh, do things like uh, rate limiting as well, like uh, some, some prevent, to prevent uh, out of memory and things like that. Now we have the store gateway. Uh, what is the store gateway? Well, it's the gateway for the store. Uh, basically, what this guy is doing is like it, it's keeping an up-to-date view of the block storage. So every time that I receive a new block or I'm, I compact a new block, store gateway uh, discover that, uh, advertise that to the querier, so it, this block starts to be queryable, uh, and and also. Uh, download parts of the index, uh, the block index, to make sure that we can uh, have a faster uh, time series lookup when you are running queries. So basically, this is like a normal uh, Cortex deployment. Optionally, you can also run rulers and alert manager, and those components are basically a multi-tenant version of the Prometheus ruler and alert manager. Again, zone awareness, again, shuffle sharded, uh, Rulers will basically, basically evaluate recording and uh, alerting rules. We will send the alerts to the alert manager. Alert manager will the dub group and uh, send the alert for the right destination like uh, Slack or page dirty, uh, you name it. Uh, basically, this is what Cortex is right now. Uh, those are the components. Uh, hopefully, it makes more sense after that. And now it's back to Alvin. Yeah, definitely. I think it makes more sense than the diagram we showed at the beginning. Um, all right, cool. So this is a list of the company that are currently using Cortex and running Cortex cluster. Um, cool. So now I want to introduce the three features that I was talking about. And the first feature is the open telemetry bridge for tracing. If you are the operator of a Cortex cluster, you will like this feature. So this feature essentially allows you to send traces to different destination. In the graph here, we have the example of sending it to AWS X-Ray. So the story behind this feature is because one day I was just you know, writing the normal status report that managers should write every day. Alan came into my office and he said, Elvin, Elvin, I, th I think there's a bottleneck between query and query front end. I don't know how to do it. And I told Alan, there's Jaeger. Cortex supports Jaeger, supports open trace. Just you know, set up Jaeger. Then Alan's like, no, I don't know. I don't know how to set up Yager. I said, well, spend some time, set it up. And Alan threw up his hand in the air and said, hey, you're not helping. Then he went out of my office. So I get back to my work. A few hours later, Alan come in with this screenshot exactly. Said, hey, Elvin, look what I got it working. I got, I got, I got it working with X-Ray. Now I see uh, there's the, the bottleneck between, between the query front end and the query. It's because the queue is overloaded. The, there's a queue between them, and it's overloaded. I was like, oh, cool, this is awesome. How did you do it? And I said, oh, yeah, I, I, do a, I integrate it with the open telemetry. 
And I was like, okay, cool, awesome. Then Alan asked me, should we open source this? I said, of course, why not? So this is uh, hours of work from Alan. It is awesome. If you ever run cluster, you have a problem, use this feature, it will help you uh, troubleshoot a lot of issue. Uh, Alan here actually used like, uh, the trace multiple times to identify multiple issues and do optimization. Even for the query vertical sharding, Alan used that to analysis, to analyze that, hey, it is actually boosting performance, and then, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So yeah, so with the open telemetry support, you can send to multiple destination. That's the major selling points, like to Jaeger, to Zipkin, to Kafka, and to AWS X-Ray. There's a lot more. You just have to com configure the exporter. And the reason why we say the open telemetry is good is because open telemetry is a CNCF project, and it, it is the protocol, it's a specification. So you don't have to worry about vendor locking. All right. The next feature I want to talk about is a partitioning compactor. So um, I haven't finalized the name for this, this feature. <laughs> so uh, I, I promise I'll, I'll work with the, the creator of this feature to come up with a better name. But for now, what's the comp com uh, partitioning compactor? Prometheus has a limitation. Each block, so Prometheus TSDB is essentially a bunch of block, right? And each block has a limitation of uh, 64 gigabytes of index size. And the reason is because they have a reference that's only able to address up to 64 uh, gigabytes. Uh, sure, we can fix that problem, but that problem is a little bit hard to fix and might take a little bit long time. Imagine switching from 32-bit uh, windows to 64-bit. It will take a while. We don't want to wait. We can wait, but we don't want to wait. So what we're doing here is that, hey, currently in Cortex, if you try to merge two blocks whose index size is close to 64 gigabytes, you merge them together, and then the result is 100 gigabytes then Cortex will choke. What you have to do is you have to upload this uh, no compact marker to the source block of the blue one, and then tell them, hey, just don't, don't, don't compact this. That's a workaround, that's not a fix, because if you look at, the, look at the size over there, 63 plus 63, it's bigger than 100, right? But then if you go through a compaction process, you guys should do the, <clears throat> do the uh, symbol table index uh, deduplication, which reduced the index size by quite a bit. So you save about like 26 gigabytes over there if you still go through with the compaction process, right? 26 gigabytes is a lot. You can save a lot of HD videos with 26 gigabytes. So what we're doing is then, hey, the new compactor will say, okay, I'll partition the matrix in such a smart way so that, uh, you know, I will still end up with two blocks but each of them will have a smaller index such that it doesn't hit the limit of the uh, Prometheus. So we'll figure out like, hey, how much partition we need. We might end up partition uh, maybe three, uh, four blocks to three or two to two, like in this example. So with this, another possibility begin, begin to, uh, to, uh, to show up, right? You can actually do compaction in parallel because your result is two blocks. Each compaction can be run in each individual compactor versus per before with the blue boxes, you need to do that in one box. Right, so the result of the new partitioning compactor is that we actually is observing about 50% compaction time reduction in our lab results for a single tenant with 200 million time series. Right, while still doing testing, this is still a work in progress. It's almost done. The implementation is there. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are just uh, doing uh, testing and finalization. Then, then we'll merge the PR. Yeah, so with this feature, you don't have the issue for the bigger than 64 gigabytes uh, uh, issue, and then your, your block will be optimized. And another, another side effect of uh, the design is that uh, the, 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 the algorithm, algorithm is able to figure out who, who's the source block of a destination block, right? So you don't have to download all the blocks from S3 into compactor when you do compaction. Those is a, that's a potential speed up of the compaction process as well. Okay, the last feature I wanna go into is uh, query sharding. This is a very cool feature in, in, my, in my opinion. Um, and before I go into that, I want to shout out to the Thernos community uh, over there for, for making this possible because it is, we actually use the Thernos code. They do some uh, uh, query analyzer uh, and spit out the output and say, hey, this query is shardable or not shardable. And then we thought, hey, we have Cortex user. Why not we bring it to Cortex as well, right? Uh, co collaboration is always beautiful. So what's vertical sharding? What does vertical mean? When we talk about horizontal sharding, uh, just imagine you have a query. You want to query from day one to day two. So you have two-day query. Uh, 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 sh uh, horizontal sharding means that you shard by time interval. So you can actually split that query into day one to just beginning of day two and beginning of day two to end of day two. And then you can split them, run them concurrently, and then get the result. That all works. 
But what if today your query is actually an uh, instant query where you want to know? The instant query means that I want to know the data right now. There's no time interval. Then how do you shard? You cannot do horizontal sharding because there's no time interval to shard. That's where vertical query sharding comes in. So I'll do a little bit of deep dive into the vertical query sharding just because I think it's a very cool concept. And then it's, it's the first step to a more optimized Pronkio engine. Uh, so this feature is already available right now. You can use it. Uh, and I forgot to mention that the, uh, the open telemetry support is actually in the mainline branch. So if you are the type of person who uh, don't mind using the mainline branch, please do, please, you can start using the feature. And then core texting, we, we try to make the mainline stable. So because uh, internally at AWS, we actually use the mainline as well. So, so we, we, we test the stuff before, before we push to mainline. So yeah, so the vertical, vertical query sharding is available in mainline branch, and then uh, the, the speed improvement can be up to, uh, can be 30% uh, plus, um, and a simple flag to enable the dosa 2 flag, and the, there's the documentation. So I just want to touch a little bit on the documentation. It is under the uh, V1 guarantee, just because it is an exper experimental feature, so it's not in the configuration list. So just be uh, aware of that, or, or you can use the slide. So let's do a little bit deep dive on the, how the vertical sharding works. So consider this matrix. You don't have to stare too high. It's fine. It's, it's fairly uh, simple. It's a, you have matrix to calculate how many users you have per region. So I'm using the North America and uh, Europe as an example. And then when you collect the matrix, usually you have multiple Prometheus instance for scalability you, or redundancy. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't just have one, right? So that's why you have part one, part two, part three. Redundancy of three is always beautiful and cost effective. And then now imagine I want to run this query. Uh, don't worry about starting this query. This is just a, hey, I want to know the user per region, right? So, and I want to get the result. Hey, I have 100 people in, uh, 100 users in North America, and I have 95 in uh, Europe. Cool. With, uh, without vertical sharding, what, 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 what's done is that the whole query is sent to one query, and the query will fetch all the data, and then just, and just, and just merge them, send it back to query from end, back to user. But if you kind of think about it, hey, I can actually do the query or the aggregation for North America and for Europe differently and color code it with, uh, I guess it's blue and purple. Yeah, blue and purple, I'll, I'll stick with that. Um, so this is how, without query sharding, how it works. Query front end, query uh, go to the store, and the store have a, is color coded just to show you that, hey, we, uh, the, the, the store doesn't store the, uh, same, uh, the, the same region in the same store. They, they, they are just you know, interleaving everywhere. Courier, do, go to a store, do everything, aggregate table, send it back to query function. Customer is happy. Well, when it's a little bit slower, they will not be happy, but you know. This is what happened to uh, query sharding. It is a little bit more complicated, but what's happening right now is that the query function will actually do a splitting. Notice that, hey, courier one, please do the European uh, aggregation. Courier two, do the North America aggregation. And the query one actually talked to the store to say, hey, please just give me the European one. Don't, don't give me the North American uh, data. So what, what this uh, allows is it reduces the network traffic, right? So right now, store one, store two, doesn't have to return all the data like before. O overall, the data, data sent over wise, there's the same, just uh, each, each part will have less data to receive. So query one will do the aggregation for the Europe, and query two will do the aggregation for North America. And right now, Query front end will have the job to merge those together. But the merging is simple. You simply merge two tables. Like you have two rows, you merge in two rows, easy peasy. So it's not too much of an overhead for the query front end. And query front end is designed for this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, and you return to the customer. Customer again is happy. I couldn't find a happier emoji, uh, emoji so that's the one I have. All right, cool. So that's a feature. And we added this uh, streaming support, I believe, in 1.13, so it's already available, right? So if you want to take away anything from this talk, take, take this away. Enable streaming between query and jester. It will save you a lot of uh, memory issues. Uh, we actually added in, add in the uh, query and jester metadata streaming. Uh, I think it's recently, or is it already released? It's not released. It's really. not released. OK. We'll make, we'll make sure it's released soon. Because uh, uh, originally what happened to Cortex, Cortex has a lot of limits, right? And then we're finding uh, different limits as we go, and we try to c combine aggregate limits. Those are to, uh, to come. So why this safe memory? is because if, if you were to get all the response from the ingester in, in, uh, in query, it's actually big, 
right? You, you can query like a gigs of data, and those have to be cached in memory before you start processing. It's gonna increase your memory footprint. You'll see a huge spike of, of your memory footprint, and then you will not be able to be garbage collected as long as you're processing the query. With the streaming, you process it, you dump it, you process it, dump it. For some query, you can process it and dump it, right? So those, those, uh, those uh, process data can be garbage collected. So you will see a smaller spike, but it still will, there will still be spike. So yeah, so streams are beautiful. Please enable the streaming. It will, it will save you a lot of headache. All right, so looking back. We released the 1.13. 1.13, we, uh, we, one of the major features of 1.13 was parallel compaction. And that was the first step to speed up to, uh, for, compact, uh, for compactor. And it's actually complementary to the uh, partition compactor. Um, so partition compactor actually make the parallelization a little bit better, uh, but, but that, that will be complementary, making compaction faster. Uh, and we also fork uh, the, the repository from Grafana Lab that's Cortex tool to Cortex because it just makes sense. We want to continue to support Cortex tool as the Cortex maintainers. There's no reason to leave it there, leave it dangling and say, hey, we don't support it anymore. It's related to Cortex. We want to support it. Uh, and I want to shout out to Alan and Frederick and uh, even uh, Nicholas for stepping up to become a maintainer of Cortex when he needed it the most. Uh, Cortex went through, went through some rust time this year, but then it's now back in good hands. Cool. So this is the longtime customer, it's Federich, because I wrote this slide before I got his permission to use his name, but he gave me the permission so I can use his name. So Federich, he run, the, run the, a lot of cluster at Adobe for his internal customers. Uh, and it's fast, right? The, 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 the ingestion time is less than one second, but Federich is very, being very conservative. In AWS, our ingestion time usually is uh, less than 10 milliseconds. Um, and also 99.9% .9 of the request is less than 1.3 seconds. 1.3 seconds might seem to be, but then if you, you know, query a long uh, range of query that's uh, fairly long, then it's actually not, not too bad of, uh, not too bit of time. And then usually I think uh, Fedor told me that his query usually spent across one to two months, if I remember correctly. I have to double, double verify. And then at Cortex, we usually take the uh, backward compatibility very seriously. So when Fedor is trying to upgrade from 0 0.61, which is a very ancient version, to 1.13, he, uh, it was pretty, it was easy, right? He got, he, he got some uh, configuration that was removed, but then you know, just remove the, some, those configuration from your YAML, then you're good to go. Um, and then he upgraded to 1.13.0 and then was able to support 100, 150 million time series instead of 32. And the bottleneck was actually just a compaction. The period compaction actually enabled a lot of time series. 150 million, might, 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 it's not the maximum. We, it, Cortex can handle a lot bigger. But there's a few factors we, we, we have to consider which can be a whole other talk. All right, so we also have the voice of the community, which are the feature that uh, we, uh, customer users have told us they want. First one, well, first of them is the out of samples, of, out of order samples for backfilling data. Um, this is already available merged into Prometheus, I think not long ago. So we'll enable that in Cortex uh, soon. Uh, same thing for down, down sampling. Down sampling, there's uh, some discussion about, hey, what exactly problem we're trying to solve for down sampling. Is it because faster querying or saving the storage? We don't know yet. So that one's still being discussed. Pertainer encryption. It is more for like people who cares about the, hey, sometimes I might accidentally, I, I might have like a, a PII data, personal identifiable information, PII data in my matrix. Then I would like to encrypt it on the rest. Even though I send to the cloud, I send to a cluster, I want to encrypt it at rest. And of course, you don't want to type one key for all the tenant. There will be, you know, what, what if like uh, you, your external customer or your internal customer are two different teams? They, they would like to be encrypted separately by different, different keys, right? Uh, which goes in hand with the, the delete time series. Why the feature is important is imagine that you, you suspect that, hey, one of my clusters is compromised. And you go ahead and revoke the access to a key, which re result in, hey, the, your matrix are not available anymore for that specific tenant. So once you identify, oh, actually, I only have like a two time series that are affected, that has like a maybe critical number on, on the, for some reason, by, the, by some silly mistakes, then you can say, okay, I'm gonna delete those two time series and then re-enable the key, then you're back to business. So that's one of the use case for using the time series and uh, pertinent encryption. There's other, other, other use cases as well. There's a lot of reason driving behind these two, uh, these two uh, uh, asks. And there's a lot more in the, our backlog. So please do tell us what, what you want. Um, Join the Slack channel, talk to us, chat with Alan and I, Federic, who are all there, who are all friendly people. You say hi to me, I'll say hi back, or I will send emoji wave back to you. 
Um, oh, usually I use beer, right, because I like beer. Uh, and you go, go through the backlog to upload the issue that you want with, uh, with a thumbs up. Or you can use the smiley face, anything, then to let us know that, hey, this is, this is important to you. If we don't understand why this is important to you, we'll, just, we'll maybe hopefully have a conversation on, on a GitHub or in Slack. So if you want to contribute, please just uh, go find out this uh, issue tag with a uh, good first time issue. Um, those are something like, oh, fixing a typo, fixing this, fixing small things, and if those are something you're interested to do, uh, please go ahead. All right, and call to actions. Cortex currently have three maintainers, and then I, I would like more, because there's so much more I want to, I want to do, but then uh, we're spreading a little thin here, so if uh, more, more people can contribute, more people can become maintainers, it would be nice. And help maintain Hamchara, maintain the Cortex IO website and the documentation. So I'm the person who's trying to maintain the metrics, Cortex metrics that I own now, but I don't have any artistic sense, right? So I need someone who you know, really know the web type, web type and all that to help me to prettify it, organize the information a little bit better and all that. Um, same thing for documentation. Cortex doc documentation is not bad right now, but it have a, a lot of room for improvement. So if you find any typo, you find any information can be reorganized uh, on the website, it will be awesome. For example, I, I wanted to update the architecture diagram on the Cortex website. That, Alan showed, or I showed uh, previously. And the, the last one is the uh, uh, automatic benchmarking framework, which is available in the Prometheus repo, but then not Cortex, and I really want it because it will be so nice if a PR comes in, I do a slash benchmark, then you can automatically see the performance difference, all that, so you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, eventually, I might get to that, but then if you cannot wait, please tell me that. Oh, I forgot to mention, please engage with the, uh, what Thernos community is trying to do. They are trying to uh, create a PronQL engine that's scalable. Right, so please let's join force with them. Let's, uh, let's create a more scalable uh, engine that supports sharding, beta sharding and all that. Right, it's, it's going to the arena of like, how do you um, optimize like Pronkio as in the SQL in the, in the old days. What is this? So, so thank you, that's everything. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit over time, but I guess we have some time for questions. I can maybe kick it off. Um, I, I noticed that um, the architecture um, of the sort of query and storage looks very similar to Druid. Was there any exchange of ideas there, or have you guys looked at Druid at all? To, to Druid, the database. Well, I guess not me, guess because, not. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. I, I have no idea what you're doing so, so yet. Yeah, you but, might check it out. It's yeah, a very it, interesting, uh, similar it? structure. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool, yeah, definitely Locked, check it out. Know, with the object storage on the back end, yeah, anyway. Any other questions? I have maybe a weird question. Sure. So in the new architecture diagram, you have many components. Which I wanted diagram? to know which one were stateless and you know, I could ah. run on say on, on the spot instance versus some that are stateful that I don't want to lose. Yeah. This one, right? So uh, I'm imagining the compactor, for example, if it's interrupted, not a big deal, can restart. Yeah. Stuff like that. So weird question. So some so so distributor query front end queries they are always uh, stateless. Some components you can choose to uh, run stateful or not. Like uh, ingesters should be stateful. You should not n never lose your data. But components like storage gateway you can choose uh, mainly because like as I'm do we are downloading parts of the blocks, uh, it makes sense to be stateful because open restart you don't have to download everything again. Uh, compactor, usually we, we run state food, but just because we want more disk. It doesn't need to, but like as I want to put a PVC there so I can put more disk if I, if I have a huge tenant that I have to compact. But if, if your node has the disk enough for the size of your tenants, it can be stateless. Okay. That was my question. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding diagram. Why ruler talks to the querier and not to query front ends? Uh, it's a good question. We are thinking and changing that. Yes. Uh, and the reason, because <clears throat> we want, so right now this is not 100% uh, correct. What happens is like the rulers run a query embedded. So it's the same code, but running the same process. 
logically is like that, but right now it runs, the ruler doesn't really talk to the query, talk directly to ingesters and store gateways. Uh, but we wanna change that. Uh, we need to do lots of benchmarks to see if it makes sense, especially because uh, rulers are running instant queries like getting recent data mostly. But we want to change that so we can uh, get some of the optimizations that we do in the query front end. Like, okay, thank you. And, and one more question. Uh, how distributor does uh, the duplication? So usually you have like a console or a TCD. So it gets one of the par pairs and say like, this is the main one, this is the, the one that will drop the data. Okay, and, and those Prometheuses, they need to talk to the same distributor all the time, or no, you can have multiple distributors no. and they will is it Everything like that, okay. that first arrow there is a load balance. Okay, thank you. Very good uh, observation about query front end. PR will come, by the way. Hmm. <laughs> No, we actually start working on, on the uh, on the on that already. There's a PR to enable that, uh, but it's just the first step. But feel free to chime in in that PR or the issue. Hey, so uh, quick question: You mentioned is it a feature in progress to uh, a sample, or sorry, to accept out of order sample ingestion? And uh, how are you looking to approach that? It's a great <laughs> idea, <laughs> very helpful. So you want to take that, Helen, or you want me? Uh, how? Yeah, so I think the how is mostly so, uh, Prometheus, right? Yeah, so like Prometheus TSDB already have support for it. Uh, basically, it's creating a new head chunk to accept the out of samples. Yeah. There is some overhead there. Uh, in our case, it's basically uh, making, like, making it available for the customers to enable it. Yeah, just before we enable, they wanna be very careful about uh, not to have users set up their own tools, right? So we're not doing our own benchmarking, wanna see, hey, wanna give a set of recommendations. If you enable this, maybe you don't wanna backfill like one year ago sample that might cause some issue like that. Yeah. Cool, so I guess uh, that's everything. We run out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Hopefully you enjoyed the talk. Thank you.